All right, welcome everybody. I'm Laura Flanders. This is Elizabeth Strapp. Hi, Elizabeth Strapp. Welcome to SLAM. Welcome to SLAM. Um, we're so happy you're here. Last time, those of you who came last time, we had a whole, a whole bunker system that you sat on. This way, today, we wanted to spread you out a little so you couldn't kind of conjugate together. And you're out there loose and wild. This is um, something we're doing. It's the second one. It's called Risky Talking. And uh, we'd like to introduce our guests. A.M. Holmes is, a fam is famous as a novelist, a memorist, and a screenwriter. Her most recent novel, called May We Be Forgiven, a shockingly heart-stopping, cannot-put-this-book-down story, which startles in non-predictive ways and then makes you cry. A.M. would say about herself, quote, I write the things we don't want to say out loud. And what we're hoping in this room tonight is that we say things that we only say to ourselves, but we say them out loud. Will you welcome A.M. Holmes to the stage? A.M. <laughs> Holmes. Anna DeVere Smith left Baltimore, she writes in her book, Talk to Me, in 1971 at age 21, to see America and to make sense of what to do with what she called the breakage and promise released by the movements and assassinations of the preceding decade. That journey took her into a career as an actress, a playwright, and an author, not to mention a MacArthur Genius Award winner, a career that's helped many millions of us not just see America, but see Americans whom perhaps we had not paid attention to before. She says she's risk averse, but I say she continues, or she's told me, she continues to believe in us, we the people as an idea and as a group, and she continues right now to believe that we can grow in empathy. You call that risk averse? <laughs> I don't think so. Anna DeVere Smith. Uh-oh, uh-oh. Anna is drawing your attention, as I was supposed to do, exactly. to these little signs that say, dare to pull. That's it, we're just drawing your attention. Should we show one more? Do you think we should demonstrate uh, 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 it just Let's once? just leave it at that for the minute. Oh, really? Okay. Let's just leave it at that right. for the minute, don't you think? Let's leave a little excitement. Don't you wonder what's gonna happen? <laughs> And I'll just say you might need to have a little friend to help you dare to pull. So, dare to pull hard. You might need to either dare to pull really hard or dare to pull other people into your project. Um, dare to pull. <laughs> also want to draw your attention to the risky truth. And uh, we will take a look at some of the risky truths you want to share. At the end of last time's risky talking, what came out very clearly was people just really wanted to know what our guests were about, what made them tick. So given that that's the question that seems on everybody's mind, um, let's start with that. I don't know if it's risky truth for you, A.M., but what makes you tick? A primal wound, hostility, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the basics. Primal wounds, hostility? Yeah. And you, Anna? I don't know. I really don't. I mean, I think it's a mystery. Okay, it's going well so far, wouldn't you say? <laughs> I want well, to see if AM's microphone is I working. I just want to add to that that I actually don't tick. I've gone uh, digital, and I just have a kind of a subtle hum. Uh, but I don't tick any longer. <laughs> OK, I'm lost already. Well, is, I just want to know if like Anne, kind of a watch if reference. Your mic is working. OK, good. That's all I want to know is the yeah. mic is working. Okay. All right, well, Elizabeth, your turn. Can I budge in a little? Because um, I was so, I'm so interested, because I deal in invisible things, like constructing extreme action. And I am so moved by both of these artists. And for A.M., she writes stories about what, from a very far distance, looks normal. You know, these normal families, these suburban situations, and then rips into it and finds out how horrific some of their, she invents. I mean, you're a fiction writer. Yes. And you're able to <laughs> invent. And I don't think. And that's the truth. 
And that's the truth. Don't believe that word she yeah. says up here. No. But I think that I, I've always been curious because of the invention of fiction. How can somebody construct 600 pages, 400 pages, a story that feels true to us? Mm -hmm. And so I always wondered, have you met these people? Is this based on something that you ran into in your life? Because I, I, I have a belief that you can't imagine something, one can't, that isn't somehow already there. So are your characters, your very own, that you have to live with day in, day out until you get that darn book finished and you can forget well, about them? They are characters, and they are from my imagination. Um, and I think it's interesting. I, totally believe that one can explore ideas, people, experiences that one knows nothing about. And in fact, that's why I do it. It allows me to understand a lot more about human behavior and why people do things and all that. Um, and you know, the, I, I firmly believe there is no such thing as normal. Normal is a fiction. Normal is a fiction. Is truth a fiction? No. Truth is a lie. No, I'm just kidding. No. Um, <laughs> no. I mean, how, how relativist do we want to get? But well, I, I think, I think that the actual thing is, you know, it's interesting. So Grace Paley, who a, was a writer and a wonderful teacher, one of the things that she very much, you know, put into my head was writing the truth according to the character. So whether it's a character, like in the end of Alice, of a jailed pedophile murderer, which was certainly the hardest character I've ever had to write, it was thinking about not what is my sense of understanding about that, but what is this character's understanding of himself, of the world we live in, of how he moves through that world. And so I think that the thing is that the way the book gets to be 700 pages long is that once you are moving through the story in a way that is organic to that character and true for that character, and it's literally asking questions like, what is the economic background of this person? Where did they come from? What have they done? What, what brought them to this moment? And you know, it's, I mean, I always say to people, it's like, what kind of toothpaste do they use? Like, I think Crest is a Jewish toothpaste and Colgate is a non-Jewish toothpaste. <laughs> so I have this whole thing about Tom's is like an atheist kind of thing. So it's like, <laughs> what is that? You know, how do they, literally, how do they live their lives? And what does it mean to them? What are the choices they make mean to them? Not what do they mean to me? Because I'm totally irrelevant to the whole thing, really. And then, can I, can I, can I ask also, like, okay, you're writing 700 pages. Let's say you get through. You I just like, start with the one. Okay. <laughs> oh, one at yeah. a time? Yeah, pretty okay. much. So one at a time. And then let's say you get through 10. Do you then stand back and say, is this true? Do I recognize this person? Or do you go all the way through the first five chapters before you start to hold your feet to the fire in that way? It's, that's a complicated and interesting question. I think for the last book, which was this novel, May Would Be Forgiven, about this Nixon scholar, Harold Silver, some, again, a person I, know, I knew nothing about. When I started writing it, I kept thinking, why is this guy so hard to write? He's driving me crazy. And I was thinking, I just hate him. He's just being impossible. And I realized that I was writing about a person who didn't know himself. Mm -hmm. So until Harold Silver began, began mm -hmm. to know who he was, I couldn't know who he was. And then the further in I got, the more interesting he became because he became interesting, in fact, to himself and to the people around him in some ways. And this character is wince-inducing. If you all have to go out and buy that book, yeah. it's wince-inducing. Um, oh boy, that's a great ad. I know. <laughs> exactly. I wince. Sitting on a tack also has the same. Can we bring Anna in? Yes, please. Anna. Anna. How do you, how, what have you learned about truth in, in your work and truth telling? And, and is there a point where you know in your work, oh, I've got this character, I've, this is right, I, I'm in, as you've said, in their words? Well, no, I don't think so. Um, I tried performing Streb. <laughs> uh, and, you know, it's never right, and you just go back um, and try again every time. In my case, I'm trying to do that word for word. Uh, I think that truth is, um, well, Johnny Cochran told me there's three sides to every story, yours, mine, and the truth. And of course, the, with the subjects that I'm looking at, I'm most interested in going somewhere but in no, where nobody can agree what the truth is. Yeah. So then I try to present all of these different points of view and leave it up to the audience to try to put the pieces together and for them to decide what's the truth. But I think it's kind of messy and it's always a little bit um, ambiguous and that, you know, that sort of gray area, that area full of doubt becomes very interesting to me. So um, 
you know, people say that we create fictions to tell big truths. Uh, and people say things like, um, you know, how the New York Times, it's, it's all the news that's fit to print. Is that what they right, say? Yes. You know? So um, somebody said to me, somebody at the Washington Post maybe had a reason to criticize the New York Times. Um, all the news that's fit to print at deadline, right? So this, right. even that, it's, it's not true. It is a, it's certainly not necessarily true. It's a, somebody seeking to tell you some things, and very often from their point of view, even if it doesn't say opinion page. So I would say that what I imagine most of us believe that the truth is somehow relative. But you know what, Anna, what's amazing to me, because I one time had the opportunity to see your, your um, interviews for each of those characters, let's say in Let Me Down Easy, um, last sometimes three, five hours, right? Like for you, know, they did, but usually well, there's an hour, it's an hour. An hour? <laughs> <laughs> it's because I wouldn't have stopped talking, is that what it was? No, because I did it here in the slam studio, and most of the time I was going, oh my god! <laughs> Okay, so even, even in, because uh, you didn't meet, you know, most people meet you in a restaurant or right. something like that. <laughs> even the Lubavitch in Crown Heights meets right. you in the kitchen. Right. If you want to talk to her, you come here in rehearsal, and you know, things are falling on people, and you'll see if you pull that dare to pull if thing. If you dare to pull it. That but, goes on around saying. here. But here's my fascination, though, what I wanted to ask you, Anna, was, um, okay, so you have an hour. I mean, that's 60 seconds, right, times 60, that's 300, no, wait, 60 seconds <laughs> times 60, 60, uh, 360 seconds, right, thank you guys. These are the night guys, and this is, I know they know the answer to that. Okay, sometimes you're, you're, you're like I was two minutes or something in, in the actual show, right, two minutes. How do you decide what like to leave off? Oh, thanks a lot. <laughs> how, do you, how do you decide? Which parts, and I know a lot of it is how people say what they say, but which parts to leave on the cutting room floor? I mean, this is AM too. So Elisa Solomon's here, who's often with me when we're trying to figure that out. And, um, you know, I just surround myself with a lot of smart people. I try my best in rehearsal. They don't like it. I go back home and rewrite it every night. And, you know, through that process, come to see, you know, I come with my own idea, and also when people are talking, I know, you know, they, I can tell that something that they've said. Like you, at a certain point, you talking about catching yourself on fire. I mean, you, we, we did talk about three hours, but that's the place where you got very, um, you know, you stopped using words, you started using sound, so that becomes, you know, interesting to me when people aren't using you know, English anymore, uh -oh. <laughs> and they're trying to communicate some other kind of way. So there's all kinds of things like that, and then uh, I do like to have people in the room with me who I know are not going to agree, and mm -hmm. that maybe gets to something about the truth, because they have, you know, all these ideas, and I'm very uncomfortable arguing with one person. I kind of don't like it, and I don't think that ever renders the truth, because it becomes this ego thing, mm -hmm. then I don't want to be in that position, so I have a lot of people who disagree. And I go home and try to revise it and come back with something new each day in the rehearsal process. I mean, but in a way, and I, I won't go on and on about this, but in a way, I feel like you're a rhythmatician. You know, What's you're that? almost a, a mu musician. You're almost about the rhythm of the way the person talks that ends up being the content, not so much the words, which I thought was fascinating. Um, Laura, but I had something. See, did people, have, have people seen the bit that we're talking about? Just to give people an idea. It, it's a story that is based in truth of well, Elizabeth. Well, interestingly enough, it's Elizabeth's truth. You say it didn't go quite that way, and Danita, who's in the story, says it didn't go that way. This is a good example. But I was there. They were so, there so were we. <laughs> they were just it was my 40th birthday present. Elizabeth's birthday present to me was a fire dance. And the fire dance involved setting a little fire it's a big fire. <laughs> right. Setting a fire just the right size so that Elizabeth could leap into the air, land on it, and put it out. While I'm the only one walk through a fire for you is playing Melissa in the background. Melissa Etheridge. 
I had no idea what was going to happen. Danita had no idea what was going to happen. I had no idea what was going to happen. <laughs> and let's just say the fire didn't entirely go out. <laughs> there exists somewhere a photograph that, thank heavens, we can't find of all of Elizabeth's dearest friends and her lover, myself, with our mouths gaping, doing nothing at all while she's on fire. <laughs> so my truth is very different from Elizabeth's <laughs> truth. Because Elizabeth, as immortalized by Anna, left the scene with a sense of incredible, well, how would you describe it? Uh, well, they thought that their partner should also light themselves on fire, I think. <laughs> Wait, who's the they here? Huh? What? I, I thought you were going to, who's the they there? Yeah, all the people at the party. Oh, I see. <laughs> but um, I'm, this is sort of like each of our versions of how do you tell the truth out here, and how do you risk to tell the truth. And Laura, I've watched Laura on many television shows, so I'm just going to throw this on you. So she was on MSNBC, Campbell Brown, and it was during the Iraq War, right? And I watched Laura, because Campbell Brown was saying something about uh, truth manipulation, right? And in a way, a risky truth. Like, when do you really get the guts to tell what's really true on MSNBC? So Laura's a journalist, you know, and um, she goes on television and different shows, and she has Grit TV, her own show, you see up there. So she said something that Campbell Brown said disturbed you about truth manipulation. And Laura turned and said, well, quote, well, your husband knows about truth manipulation. He handled PR for the Pentagon for the Abu Ghraib scandal. He was turning reporters away while the torture was going on. And she went, that has nothing to do with the story. You know? But I was sitting at home thinking, uh-oh. Well, that's the last time she went on Campbell Brown. And it was. I thought, that was don't it. say that. Never you know. again. No, but then, and there's many examples of that. So how do yeah, you many examples of not me. stop yourself? <laughs> Gets invited, she looks so great, she says she's In retrospect, I think, is it, is it worth it? Is that moment of a comment, Campbell Brown in this case was starting a brand new show, I felt people should know she was married to a Fox analyst and a Pentagon PR man, and yet she's reporting on the war. Was it worth it? What do you think? I'm not sure. Right. Was it worth it for me to say one kind of gotcha thing and never be on again? I'm not sure. I, I, I mean, it's one of those questions. Yeah, but you can't control yourself. I can tell. <laughs> well, I can tell. That. I, I'm like, she starts to say something, and I'm like, Duh. you know, and I'm all the way home, and I know that she will not be able to really. What about but, couples but therapy? Would that be a couples therapy? <laughs> <laughs> well, it gets to the question of playing it safe. I mean, I would love to know from you, dear Elizabeth, and part of the point of risky talking is to invite you into our home. Invite you into our conversation. Oh, they do a hell of a Thanksgiving. Yeah. It's, no, it's seriously. So one of my questions to you, Elizabeth, is do you ever, ever, ever play it safe? Um, but, you know, there's a formal reason why I don't usually choose to play it safe. And that formal reason is, and I'm sure A.M. and Anna and you too, would realize that if you're going to, in action, if you're going to try and calibrate what series of events are going to reach the audience and have them recognize it. You know, almost like what is the anthropology of the action, the rough action that's happened in the United States, let's say, for the last hundred years. And I can't do pirouettes up there. That's out. And I made a list of moves I would never do again. Um, and they were all the dance moves I trained 20 years to acquire. And so I believe that danger and um, the fact of the potential for getting close to the possibility for injury, was necessary to be able to encapsulate the, the message of extreme action so that the audience would not be told a story, but would feel the truth, recognize the truth. And there's a long, long distance between the fact of real damage to a human being and um, you know, actually escaping it by half a second or half an inch. And I try and get as close to that half a second and half an inch as, as I can with the dancers, who are, many of them are in the room. There's Cassandra, there's Sarah, there's the other Sarah, and, uh, and there's Felix here. I don't know, I know his name was on there, but they know, and now they split seconds, bam, 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 even more, right, guys? You scare me. And for me, if you don't do that, then with action as a language, you are not telling the truth. Well, what about language as language? Do you ever feel like you're playing it safe, I am? Well, you know, I, I think about it sort of in the terms of that in order to 
make progress, one has to risk failure. Um, and I think that the, the question for me is always um, along the lines of, I, I just don't think any kind of progress comes from the center of something, it comes from the edges of things. And so I think I'll ask myself, like, I, I've been trying to write this one story for years now, um, a lot of them, and I, and I sort of will say, why, why are you not done? And it just seems to me very boring, and I think because you've not risked enough. Mm. There's not, you haven't actually tried to do something that could fail horribly, and until you risk that, then it's not gonna ever be really inventive and really take it to a new place. But that's... You're frowning, you know. Anna. Well, I just think it's kind of inherently, um, and I, I hope that when the audience talks, that the writers in the audience will say something about this, or speakers, you know, I think it's harder for language to do what you're talking about because mm -hmm. it is, you know, it's used to, re it's not that we're lying, you know, the point I suppose is to reveal something um, through it, but it feels like a, a bridge of some kind that's not necessarily the same thing as you're talking about with that big distance. Most of us think danger is right here, and you see this other kind of distance. And I remember talking to you before about how I um, am interested in speech as an action, or that's what drama is, is that it's a, an action is happening as we speak, but you're really interested in the speechless moment, I think, when something happens and you, there are no words. You, you, it, it, it happened, it happened so fast, and you're left there just stunned, trying to make sense of it, whereas in drama, we're counting on the words of the dramatist to bring us to understanding as we say the words, mm. because we're in a psychological relationship with the words being said that help us think and feel as the character. And you know how much pleasure it gave me. I went over to where Elizabeth has breakfast with my favorite present that I've ever given her. Oh, I have which is a, which is a t-shirt, a sweatshirt that I saw in a gym where I was working out. Um, everybody has a plan till they get punched in the face. Mike Tyson. Yes. <laughs> and she was absolutely delighted. Uh, that is the that's the most truth-based <laughs> sentence I've ever heard. <laughs> And I one time was at a, a gym in, in South Philly, and they were working at the same time we were working. This was in the 80s. And there was a, you know, a middleweight boxing guy there. And I said, I just want once, and didn't, um, I mean, in Unboxing, do you know who wrote on, Unboxing? You guys do, right? It's, it's Joyce Carol Oates. That's what I say. It's exactly, a beautiful yeah. essay. And she said that at the other end, in, in this essay in one part, at the other end of a heavyweight's punch, is 10,000 pounds of pressure. And I thought, I just want to feel that once. Just once. Just like I would like to get shot like Chris, Bur Chris Burden just once. Only, but he wouldn't do it, because he's a gentleman. And I felt like, well, I, it was probably my last chance, because now it would really probably not feel so good. Um, but I would want to know how that extreme thing felt. And I also have a bullet dance that I want to do that no one wants to do either, which would be, <laughs> there's places, I guess you exactly know not. how some people get shot? like shot accidentally and it's not good and all that. But sometimes it just goes through one side of your kidney, around your stomach, <laughs> at the other side of the spine, and comes out into these neutral, fleshy areas. And if you could control the bullet in that way, if I could choreograph it, like maybe somebody would pull the trigger but <clears throat> shake, and the bullet would go like that. Anyway, that's sort of one of my swan song dances that I've been very <laughs> curious about. Let's see, what's the last move I want to make? That would you want be... to explode. Well, I do want to explode, yeah. I thought that would be easier than getting shot. But... That raises the question of control. <laughs> <laughs> you, you mentioned that you'd like to be able to control the trajectory of the bullet. Um, is there a relationship between truth and, and control? I actually don't think you can control anything, the truth is. A real thing that comes out. Do you guys feel that your best sentences, let's say if you could say this is the best, what is that something is streaming? What's the first line in Gravity's Rainbow? A something was seen streaming across the sky. Anyone know? The, this is the mind. quiz portion. <laughs> no, no. But is there a sentence that you feel you wrote that maybe was the best sentence you ever came up with? 
the one you've yet to write. Or, or does it have to be a paragraph or a chapter? This is AM and Anna. And, and I want you to answer the question about control. Well, I, well my point is, is that I don't think you can control it. So The I'm closest really like thing I can say to any of that is I think there's something about as a novelist and you make up these things, you feel like you're in control and you're putting you know, words in people's mouths. So it's, I, I would say the one thing that's very difficult is that when, when that day ends and all of a sudden you enter real life and people say things to you and you think, who wrote that? <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's not, I mean, you know, I don't want to hear that. Um, but I you think, wrote it. No, in, like when you re-enter reality at the end of the day and people start talking to you and you're not in control of actual people. <laughs> I think that's, that's like the novelist. Oh, actual you know. people. No, because while you're in there, you're in there, and you're like, this is what she said, this is what he said, oh I'm God. doing this, I know how it's going, and then you enter your real life, and they're like, people in there talking to you, <laughs> wanting things. It's like how you can't go like this with the people in real life that you can on their phone. I go like this. <laughs> Anna, with my kid. You? Do you have a perfect sentence? <laughs> no, but what she's saying, that it reminds me of being in rehearsal with the Avenelli Dance Company, and... Um, and I was seated next to Judith Jamison. Where I worked, for, did a piece with her, which uh, was where, exceptional. Where I did the, the so-called libretto, and she, of course, choreographed the dancers. And we were in rehearsal. <laughs> there was like, you know, thirty Alvin Ailey dancers, and she had a um, remote control of the from the TV, and she was she <laughs> was trying to because you know they was learned, it a taser? Right. Was it a taser? No, it wasn't a taser. No, it was, <laughs> but you know they learned dances by right. what, and she was like clicking. And then she realized, oh, <laughs> Michael, stop that. I mean, she couldn't. It was I, so great that she was in that moment, no, you know, that's that so she totally thought she could control it totally, like the TV. Totally. <laughs> if only, right? Can I yeah. drag us somewhere else? Sure. And I want to hear, I want to begin to collect your, your risky truths, folks. And I'm kind of interested that none of you have dared to pull Well, where are, where are our buckets? Um, do you have any ace in there? This is one of the, this is one of the challenges of, of risky talking and one of the challenges that spurred us to want to have these conversations. Perfect. Okay, which is lie. that we're trying to find ace. ways to have the worlds of creativity and just... art and movement, in Elizabeth's sense, connect with or talk to wow. the worlds of politics and social change and... Oh. What the heck was that, I was thinking. Here. Thank you, those people. Thank you, those people who dared to talk. Who did that? <laughs> was that someone's phone? We're trying yes. to figure out how to connect. Thank you. How to These connect are worlds, connect conversations. And I'll just tell you what I mean, in that I'm listening to Anna. Anna said this great line about, um, well, she quoted Mike Tyson about you have a plan, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. And my mind is such that I went back and thought about where I'd just been, which is <laughs> Appalachia. You may wonder how I went from Mike Tyson to Eastern Kentucky. <laughs> but I wanted to ask each of us, what do we think it's going to take to create the punch in the face for this country and this economy and this environment for us to make change? Because there in Eastern Kentucky, I saw two things at war with one another. One, the tremendous legacy, the powerful legacy of success of the coal industry. It's beautiful. That has been so good for so many people for so long, if you're not talking about your actual religious experience as a worker, but just simply in terms of power and wealth extracted from that part of the world. The jobs that for a while paid good wages were around for so long that for people to grapple with the idea that coal is over, that we've reached the end of coal, that actually we need to do something else, is like the conversation we're having about what will drag us to change our plan. And there are some people who, have who are willing to take that risk and who are willing to talk about, okay, let's, lose, let's let go of the control that we've had over our lives and start grappling with something else because we better, because there's no more coal coming out of these mountains. Or the jobs have left, or the jobs no longer pay what they pay. And so I don't know how to insert that question into this lovely conversation about risk without being such a friggin' downer. <laughs> but this is what we want to try. 
right? To integrate. So go for I'll, it. What's I'll it take a risk, take to actually. Be a punch in the face for our economy, for our political system. Here's, here's I'll risk saying something that I don't, even, I don't even know what I'm going to say I'll exactly. It's so that risky. But <laughs> no, you know what concerns me, and I, having never said this out loud, I don't even know how to articulate it exactly, but along the lines of you're asking what is the punch in the face for this country, and I would say here's my greatest fear about that. I think that we are punch in the face proof in the sense that we are two countries. We are the country that says United States of America that's on your dollar bill. We're the country that has a government and all of those things, and they have absolutely nothing to do with what it is to live in America right. and to be an American. And until those things relate and until people actually realize, oh, we could do something, there's, there's a complete dissonance between people and, and state. So. Anna? Well, I don't know. I mean, the new project I'm working on, which is about schools and failed schools and the people who um, uh, don't get to experience, you know, at least sort of school learning as a joyous matter. I mean, I think they get punched in the face every single day from the time before they're born. Um, and so if not before they're born, soon after they're born. And I don't think that's about a sort of uh, idea of being able to take a risk. I think it's their life. Um, and they don't get a chance to have a plan. Uh, and I think the riskiest thing for us to do about that would be to see how we could encourage and coerce and try to bring people to be like we have in different times in American history, um, concerned about more than just ourselves and the people who we think that we love, and to go to a bigger idea of love, which is really not just about cuddling, but really reaching and saying, you know, about those who really don't have and are living broken lives with broken hearts, bring them to me rather than put them over there as far away from me as you possibly can. Because I don't want to see them. I don't want them to contaminate my children. I don't want them to mess up my fabulous life about who I am. And we're really, really far from developing that imagination. So I just think there's a lot of people getting punched in the face every single day. They don't need to be looking for a risk. So there could be something about what we're doing, which is a little, I don't know, it's not really risky. Because it's, uh, you know, we're just having a good time talking. But I could be wrong. But Anna, this goes to what we were talking about earlier when we were hiding in that black cube. Um, <laughs> which along the ideas of, you know, if, if states and cities and whatever can identify which we know they can, who these children are very early on. In, in, kinder, in some areas in kindergarten, in, in third grade, we know who will not graduate from high school. Then what is the extreme both passivity and, and roadblock to actually taking action? And I, I, I mean, I always think that, again, realizing that each of us is capable of doing for others and of change, but there's an enormous amount of both passivity and frustration but how do we then make those things happen? We lack imagination. I wrote to David Harris, the activist from the <coughs> 60s, yesterday, because I was going to address some people who run a, a, a gala for this group of people who run something called the uh, Juvenile Law Center in, in Philadelphia. And I, I wanted to have like an ecumenical thing where I would be able to say something that a Christian said, say something that a Jewish person said. I knew what I would have a Muslim say, but I didn't have a Buddhist remark. And he became a Buddhist, I think, when he was in jail for dodging the war in the 60s. And I wrote to him. I said, send me something from Buddhist. And just this idea that you know, the, the suffering of 7 billion people is yours, right. that takes an extraordinary imagination to believe that. It's a real act of imagination. But I think anything that has moved in the world because of compassion is because it was an extraordinary act of imagination. In reality, I have absolutely nothing to do with you. You're here and I'm here. You're here and I'm here. You're here and I'm here. So to imagine that I can really feel for you or of you, even in acting, the empathic imagination right. is an imagination. I can't really feel like you felt about falling on the fire. I'm imagining that. So I think that this, you know, the crisis that 
uh, I'm interested in right now is the one about how to start to build a really healthy, robust moral imagination. Do we think we don't need imagination because we have so many damn facts? And we have so much information we, coming to us from so many kind of sources, and it's so concretized, and then we can compare this set of facts with those set of facts. I mean, I used to go and talk to journalism schools, our school, Columbia Journalism School. Once a year, I would go and you know, speak to a class. And in the early 90s, middle 90s, even through the end of the 90s, it was a fantastic experience, surrounded by people who maybe they were about to go into the more of commercial media, but right then at that moment, they had the <coughs> drive and the passion and the vision of what a journalist's job was in America, and it was still a proud and exciting thing, a brave thing. By the time I most recently did it, which was after 9-11, sometime in the last five or six years, I was there with a guy talking about torture survivors and treating torture survivors. And I was talking about my experiences having gone to Rwanda after the genocide, where, where you were also. And um, the questions from the students were all, how do you know if they're telling the truth? How do you know they're not just saying those stories to get a visa? The, the critical thinking component had completely taken over the empathetic, uh, empathic imagination. And something just shriveled inside as I thought, wow, is this perhaps what we're teaching people, not to go with their hearts, Listen, but to I, sit I right know, here? I know a kid who was able to talk her parents out of making her stay at Dalton. She'd been there since she was four. And her parents were, very, were black people who started out very poor. And they, you know, first time she came to them with this idea, I want to go to LaGuardia. <laughs> nope. And I mean, it was like a ridiculous idea. And this kid kept coming back and kept coming back and they kept laughing until she said to them, I want to go to a school where people have real passion, not strategic passion. And they let her leave Dalton. And she's at a public school right now. How old was she at that point? She was, oh. she was getting ready to go to you know, ninth or 10th grade. Okay. And so I think that this is exactly right. You know, All of us who teach know that there's a kind of inherent cynicism. And I think it's a rage that in fact, they feel out of control about how much information is mm -hmm. out there and how will they ever absorb enough of it not to seem stupid in front of their classmates. I mean, you teach at Princeton. Well, I was going to say, the, the, you know, when you said the thing about imagination, it's so weird because that is, in fact, what I teach. And I've been on this whole sort of kick about the future is not what you know, it is what you can imagine. Because two, two sort of major points, one, there was a book, I can't remember the name of it, that talked about there was a point in time where you could have read every book. You could know everything that was to be known. Now all you can know or is... Or presume that you... Well, no, because there were only that many books and that much information. Now you can only know what the footprints are to get to the next known thing. But importantly, like the kids at Princeton have been incredibly educated down a very kind of narrow path because they were identified as academically talented. They know some things, but they actually don't know how to imagine anymore. And I see this all over the place. And so even the other day, I was teaching a group of teachers here in New York City, and I was talking to them about how do you teach people to imagine. And the truth is, if you can't imagine yourself as successful, whatever that means, you can't be successful. You can't, if you can't put yourself there, you can't get there. And that's, to me, goes across whether it's science and physics and math and literature to if you can't imagine that you can get a job or that you can graduate from high school, you can't. Because it, that just cuts it off right there. Just to rebalance slightly, I'm thinking of this. If I could get up and pull this right now, maybe I'll get up but and could pull I, this. You're going to whack me in the head Laura, I'm going <laughs> to. Do you want to pull this with me? No, I no, really don't. Laura, I want to say <laughs> something. Can I, can I pull it up? You can pull it. Can yeah. someone help her pull those? Someone, someone get up. We need just, everybody I'm on rebalance there. This is a heavy I beam. All right, ready? 20 feet. One, um, two. I'm going to try to talk during this. No, it's never going to happen. Oh! Okay. It's so Jacoby and Myers. What? <laughs> <laughs> you are so cool. Okay, but here's some, I want to bring in something about, I have this theory about class. Yeah. Because in a way we're talking about people who live through their whole lives and don't get that job and have already had the hard knocks, the hard knocks, the hard knocks. And, um, you know, I happen to have an adopted sister who is now 65, a year older than me, and I have to, um, she's a, 
good, kind person. You know, there's not even a big of a, bit of acrimony is in her. But she, just the way she talks and expresses herself and the degree of anger that filters through the life she's had to leave, lead, I feel like I'm wondering, OK, we can help start at third grade to figure out, in a way, the code of how do you pass as a middle or upper class person. Like, speech is really one of the main things, right? And you have to have clean clothes. Well, I don't even believe it. Well, I shouldn't say anyone in here. But I believe we would have trouble figuring out how to make friends with people that are really downtrodden, that our level of common practice would be so distended that flailing for that thing, that communicative thing, one sentence, I, I just am trying to understand. I think if you start, as de Blasio says, in preschool, maybe that's the only way. But I don't see how underprivileged people, how do you fix that when they're already 40, 50, 60? Or are we going to just abandon them and start at the beginning? But are we really saying? Whoa. Told you. Okay, now. That was not supposed to go back. Why did that forth. happen? Why did that happen? That's what we discussed, Strat. I saw you somebody. That, somebody pushed that. You said it was impossible. No, no, exactly. it was just, someone, exactly. I saw a shadow go by and <laughs> pushed it. You said it was Newton, that it couldn't go any way other than I, this. Guy. And I know. <laughs> because I was very concerned I know, we had a whole, when we yes. arrived no. that what would happen if I threw my head back and laughed around here, would I get hit in the head? She said it cannot. Never go that way. You just saw it. <laughs> I mean, this is right Imagine. in front of all of us. Imagine. A mystery. <laughs> is it true? Did you see someone go over there and push it, you guys? No. But they, you know, if you go so fast and sit down again, no one notices. <laughs> Sarah, there, there, was there was an implementer. There was an implementer. Anna, you can trust me. Honest. All right. <laughs> I would oh, like to bring so in a worried. couple of the questions that we've gotten from, from the audience. Okay. I just want to say there's a few things hanging out there. One, the idea that really the American we doesn't have room for anyone who isn't upper or middle class. That's interesting. Is that true? Is that a risky truth? The American truth? what? We doesn't have, she said, you know, we need to train people to be able to pass. Really? We don't have... But isn't that a certain kind of judgment about what people are supposed to be? I, agree. I mean, I have a problem. I have a problem with their strength. Well, I, I mean, how are they going to make a living? My, my thing is, well, how, 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 you know, how do they? But I again, mean, because it's, it's all subjected to then, quote, our judgment of what those things are. And I think that a person, in, in a bigger sense, one has to kind of redefine that and realize that we need. To, I mean, not that we shouldn't make sure. That people have clean See, clothes. There's someone over um, there. Is that like the drug at the drum roll? Okay, whatever. Anyway, you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, okay, okay. But uh, I, I mean, my problem is the issue of class and, and money. Of course. And how do they? They could start their own economy somehow. But I they don't have an economy. Exactly. They have sorry, sorry, economy. Exactly. I mean, one that pays their bills, one that allows them to have easy. These I don't know. Who's underground this economies. You guys are the thinkers. Underground economies do pay bills. We have more people at this point. I mean, we have as many people as a as a. I think it's something like. Oh dear, a larger <laughs> underground economy yeah. in this country than all but three economies in the world. Something like that. There is an enormous so-called underground economy here. And it's actually one of the truths right. we talked about um, when we were discussing this forum was, I believe, one of the big risky truths in America is that we don't just have one economy, that we don't just have this hegemonic system called the economy. We actually have a whole patchwork and kaleidoscope of different economies. Exactly. And that most of us, many of us, don't work in any kind of way that that traditional employment model um, tells us everybody works or should work. Uh, I think it's a much bigger question, the, the question that you're raising about how do we have a multi-class society where everybody deserve, every, everybody has rights and respect and empathetic, mm -hmm. and, and why can't I say it? It's some cross between emphatic and empathic. Empathic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, compassion and, and um, respect. That's one question. Um, and I just want to say that the rebalancing that I wanted to do here was I felt like we were, di were dissing kids and young people. And who was it that took out, who has been in the leadership of the movements that have changed this country 
every time. It's people under 30. So who was it that had the imagination, even as recently as, as um, Occupy Wall Street, had the imagination to say, we can change this country. The dreamers, the protesters for fair uh, immigration rights, who were on the streets just yesterday, May 1st. It wasn't we, the oldies, it was young people. So while we are talking about students, and I, I kicked off that anyway, wall, I didn't want yeah. to uh, go, to just leave them. that unsaid. OK, sorry, well, I'll stop. OK, could I say one Quest thing about the sloth? Truth. Laura, can I, can I say one thing about the sloth? The sloth? What they do when they're scared. What the, 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 what, the sloth? What the sloth? Animal? What the sloth? There's an animal the called the sloth. The animal that hangs up And down. everybody has their you know, defense mechanisms in the animal kingdom. And this is um, something I discovered recently. The common, oh, I'm sorry, it's the shrew. Oh. They're related to the sloth really? or sloth. No, I'm not sure. Person. But anyway, the common shrew, <laughs> right. the I, common yeah, shrew protects itself from predators by dying of fright. Well, you know, that, that, you actually, that actually brings us to one of the, I got, it's instead amazing. of questions, yeah. I got comments. And one, one of I them got was, I got too. great uh, risky fear truth. slows my actions too much. And I think that's an oh. interesting concept about sometimes what do we do when we're afraid and that it, it actually can be paralyzing. Mm -hmm. Um, and there, you know, you can think of that fear, whether it's social fear, economic fear, personal fear, whatever, but. I find that I get paralyzed when I'm really angry. It's my stupid upper class British training. I'll trade you because I get kind of violent. Instead of expressing the rage, <laughs> I go very, very silent. And that's not good. I have a risky truth that somebody shared. In fact, there's a couple that I'd love to share together. One is I'm often afraid. And another is, I usually would rather be by myself. And to that person, I'd like to meet I say, that person. thank you for coming out to this group. <laughs> um, Am, what do you have? But it, but it speaks to it's risky to express vulnerability. Yeah. Right? Yes. I mean, to have two out of three being expressing a vulnerability, and shall I share the last one? Sure. It's two years after she left, I'm still angry at my ex. I hate this about myself. Wow. So three out of three people, at least whom I got, are sharing fears, anxieties, Vulnerabilities. Are yours like this? Well, could I just read one? I'm sleeping with two women who are lesbian lovers, unbeknownst to both of them, and I'm a man. <laughs> wow. I wasn't, I wasn't going to read that, but it tied in with yours. Okay. Let's... I got one that said you were a kind and generous person <laughs> liked by others. Wait, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I, was, I thought it was like Chinese fortune cookies for a second there. Um, I got one that, that is serious and I think is interesting. Aging is undermining my identity. Um, it's written in invisible ink, which is what happens also when you get older. You become invisible. <laughs> <laughs> Not really a joke. <laughs> then I have, I am often embarrassed of my race and who I am, which that's a very real and, and painful truth. There's a Mitt Romney one I'm just going to skip. Um, <laughs> Skip. When it comes to art, we are living in the dark ages of communication and connectivity is killing us. It's confusing. Uh, Anna, over to you. Mine are sort of sad. <laughs> oh. It isn't just fortune that favors the brave, so do justice, faith, and love, and so does loss. Mm. I don't know if the life I'm living will ever make me happy. I want a job that will pay me more money so I can travel on my sick days. <laughs> Does anyone want to volunteer That's to admit truth, that right that was there. theirs? So. It is risky to sit too close to another. Oh, here's a good one. This, I love it. I'm not planning my retirement. <laughs> Join the club. I am Super. more beautiful than I think. What do we I, I think mine were sort of sweet. Yeah. They were sweet. I want to thank everybody for sharing their risky truths so far. Streb, do you have any you want to share? Uh, well, I'll just read the ones I got. Speak my mind, dare to love everyone. To tell always the truth. Fascism is inside too. Mm -hmm. Right now I want to focus on making a lot of money and not so much change. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, 
I, I prefer to ride my bicycle without a helmet. These are great. These are good truths. They have a little book. They're good truths. Good questions, folks. We'd love to include you in this conversation. Hey, it's not on any particular trajectory. You can take it anywhere you want. <laughs> Over there. Uh, there's probably a mic we want to get to. Uh, I'll give you this one. And remember, if you don't ask questions, we'll ask you questions. Yeah. This is tying in the Tyson quote and the lack of imagination. I wonder if you could speak to teaching what I would Here. describe as maybe a privileged class that lacks imagination for their lives turning out unprivileged. And if that might constitute a punch in the face, and if that might be a collective future for our nation. I, I want to tell you the most interesting experience that I've had. So I've taught in lots of places, including prisons and places like that, that I really like. And my experience at teaching <clears throat> at Princeton may be unusual because it may be who selects to take my class. I have the most diverse student population I've ever had in my entire life. Um, the majority of the students are the first person in their family to go to college. Um, they are often from families that do not, that English is not their first language. I give them, we do actually a lot of drawing in my writing class, and the other day I passed out some photographs. It was supposed to be, this is a place where something happened, and I gave somebody basically like a mobile home, and the girl went, this is the most beautiful house. And there's, so there's so much that I realize that I don't even know, including one of my students last year had gone to a boarding school preschool in China. Um, she was sent there when she was three because her parents felt her grandparents were spoiling her. Um, incredibly depressed girl, but she managed to get herself to Princeton. So I think it's not, it's that thing of it's not what it seems. And then of course last year I had one boy who was going back to Texas and I was sure he's from a very, very wealthy family, very beautiful, adorable kid and he kept saying, when I graduate, I'm going to have a lot of responsibility. And I kept thinking, I bet you are. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, his dad has AIDS and his mom has ALS. Wow. So it's so not what you think it is. Um, and that's been one of the most interesting pieces of it for me, honestly. That it, and, it, and also the gap that's happening, because here they are at this place that also does have this incredible privileged history that we all know about, and that also is existing still in that place. And so what happens is there's the gap between them and the other people at Princeton and this enormous gap that forms between them and their families and their home countries because all of a sudden they're not that person anymore either. So one of the big things I feel like I'm always dealing with is how to help them become who they are or who they're going to be and hold all those pieces at once. You did say in one of the interviews I read about May We Be Forgiven, your most recent extraordinary novel, that you have since 9-11 felt a responsibility well, maybe it wasn't quite as literal as that, but that you have recently been working to end your novels on hope, not on death. Well, do you feel that is a responsibility you bear? The, two, the, the responsibility that I think we bear is um, that we are not just responsible for ourselves, we're responsible for each other. And that's, the big, that's what you were saying. I mean, that's the biggest responsibility. And how do you remind people of that or teach that. And I think in terms of the hope thing, it turns out it's much harder to end a novel going up, that they just naturally go downward. That's like the way literature goes, you know, like crime and punishment, you know, oh wow, love that, <laughs> felt good after. Um, so I think, and I, I get all these, like these nasty reviews, oh, like she's gone soft on us, I mean, you have no idea. Uh, it's so much harder to t somehow organically have things, not even work out, but have them evolve to a place where there is the possibility that they might be a little bit better. I loved it about your novel. Because I was sure it was going to go down and it went up. It was going to go down. <laughs> it went down several times. I was like, no! Do you feel like you're a, you, you have a responsibility to be, to be a hope carrier? Huh. I don't know. I mean, I think I am a hopeful person. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I think I'm a hopeful person by nature. I think that's what it is. You know, I don't think I have a, 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 a I'm not, you know, like Gloria Steinem is a hope, hopeaholic. That's what she calls herself. 
And there, I think activists often are yeah. the people who feel mm -hmm. responsible, you know, to bring hope. The people united will never be defeated. But I, I think it's in my nature to be so more than that I feel it's a responsibility to be so. And I'm not that excited when a director tries to get me to like end the play on an up note. I, I always concede, but we fight about it. Oh, and the producers always <laughs> want that. So I try to be more agreeable these days as a theater practitioner. I just want to add, I think it's not necessarily about being hopeful or, or sort of you know, creating hope where there is. And I think it's, and this is, goes to what you were saying a little bit, it's about asking people to think and asking people to consider, which is also like in your work, where you're presenting things and you're not saying this is true. It's, it's the notion of, here's something I want you to be thinking about or responding to. And, and the idea is that if you make something or you do an action and, and people have to pause and reconsider things, it makes us look at ourselves and what's around us mm somehow a little bit differently. I'm always trying to put my finger on the genius activist trait of being able both to say the house is burning down and to say we can build a better house. Well, you have to. At the same time. Right. Yeah, that's right. I think that's right. And they're out there. I think we have another question. Yeah, this makes me nervous, so I'm not sure if I'm doing it. That's what they like. Thank you for telling they, us They that. like that around here. Nervous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Come closer. Yeah, talk talk and speak <laughs> Um, you know, there's something about our generation aging, and there's something about activism and hope uh, that I think we all had. And I think I'm putting it that way because bureaucracies, if we're talking about changing kids' lives, we're talking about prison, we're talking about kids aim for prison, we have to deal with those bureaucracies that exist to keep things the same. And they don't like creative thinking, but they'll tolerate it. And one way they get you, and they keep things so much the same, is by getting people to agree. It doesn't matter if they get credit. It doesn't matter if X, Y, Z. And you do your great work for a while. Then they control you, because they can suddenly turn the tables. And everything that was strong about you, you, you know, if you don't have people or an institution backing you up, they're expert at turning the tables as people are getting older, stronger, wiser. Get you out of the way, the new, younger, hopeful kids come in, but you don't ever get anywhere. You get very, you don't get as far as you can because people have to keep reinventing the wheel. And I don't know exactly how to address that, but um, want to respond to that? That feels like a thing you should respond. To. <laughs> I think we talk about why it's important to have some collective voice and some collective power for people in the workplace. I mean, it sounds so literal as a response, but I think that's where the idea of collective bargaining came from. The idea of having some kind of say as an individual worker against your employer was something we came up with as we decided that the truth was that didn't work 150 years ago. And we've gone back to that place where people are kind of on their own. And these issues of aging, I think, fly directly in the face of a culture that wants to believe it will always be young, always be new, always be beautiful, always be bright and brave. That's American culture. And we're having to grapple, I think, that you talk about it in your, your work, Anna, with the broken parts of this society of ours. And it's part of what fuels people's panic about aging, refusal to talk about death, all of the things you talk about in your, your play. I think if we actually dealt with aging better and res more respectfully, uh, it would require, I mean, in order to do that, would require us to deal with the fact of of death, and it's coming a long way from where you said, but the bureaucracies, the same bureaucracies that you're talking about are the bureaucracies that are selling us the constant importance of the new and the fresh and the young, right? Yeah, I mean, I guess I, I always think that art is a panacea um, 
to spread out, especially action. I really believe it could change people's hearts and minds and souls and kids too. And well, flying right. is, is heaven. Flying is really freedom. And I feel that this country has an elitist veneer. I mean, there's a location for the arts to happen. I'm talking mostly about the performing arts, and it's probably true about the visual arts too. But um, to happen in the ivory towers. And I feel that there could be this fusion notion where maybe it's about you know, um, social venture capitalism that focuses on culture, that doesn't say, oh, it has to go in the schools, but happens in people's accidental everyday pathways. And if we could figure out, I think, how to, in this enormously huge country, um, place it like, 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 a, like a thousand small gorgeous gardens all across the United States, I actually think that would aid and abet people's souls and minds and hearts um, rising up just a little, you know, rather than saying, you know, we have to educate people. You know, that's the argument, like you educate people and then they come to the theater. Well, they're not comfortable in the theater. It's embarrassing to go in the theater and not know what the behavior code is. Um, um, I mean, look, look around when we're in the theater. I mean, even here, you know. So I, I, I think that, and how to do that is what I'm really obsessed with for the next 20 years. I, I think, you know, I'm always interested when you, when you talk about that, and uh, this, this whole place, SLAM, is of that DNA to, uh, have what I call a radical welcome or a radical hospitality. Um, I also think we, all, we don't always know who's listening. I took out my phone, not to be rude in text, but to share something with you that happened. No, but the other day, um, I was just doing research in California about the fact of kids who can't make it through school, and many of them end up incarcerated. And um, on the last day, we invited uh, everybody that we interviewed to a rap party that we had. And uh, we had rented this house where we did some filming and stuff like that. And the rental agency has a woman who cleans the houses when we're, you arrive and you know, cleans them when you leave. And I thought, you know, we need some help for this party. You know, Beatrice, would you mind just coming to help? So she was helping at the party and cleaning up. And when I left and got back to New York, I get this text from her, uh, Latina from El Salvador, rough, rough, rough situation of getting to this country. With your guess, G-U-E-S-S, -S, but you know, none of us, as well, to your sister, checks. but none of us spell, Can't spell on, those on things. these things. So they that's an them. equalizing thing right then and there. <laughs> <laughs> With your guess last night, it was so positive we can light up the whole planet last night. I was standing so tall, so happy to be there. Thank you. But how many people would think to put Beatrice around the table yeah, when we're exactly. deciding what's going to happen to kids exactly. in our schools? Exactly. And so I think sometimes, uh, even in philanthropy, we, you know, we just don't think about who could be invited to participate. And in this world that we live in in New York, you know, uh, you and I sit at some of these same tables. Yeah. It's the expected group. Or who might tell us something that we never could have imagined, right? And maybe disagreed with. Like who would have actually the, um, the answers that we cannot invent out of our own brains? Right. But Streb, it also comes to you coming to this place. It's not just inviting people to our table. It's we have to go, go to their table. Go. Well, it's That's ridiculous. Yeah. It's, it's like, again, it's so, the, 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 in a way, the arrogance of saying, we'd like to invite you to our table, because it's the right table. We right. need to be going to, to where people are, to where their table is, to well, figure out idea. what their the, table is. The Absolutely. But at the same time, <laughs> this, this we're, we're we're all, we live in a nomadic world. So Beatrice was there, Absolutely. picking up cups, listening right. to people talk, and this is her assessment. Right. But, but All right, also, we have a I question. Can slam. we just bring in another but question? I want to make SLAM their place. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. That's what you can Our do. place. <laughs> I, I'm just curious as to whether or not this audience knows the history of uh, the origin of public schools, of public education in America, uh, that it grew out of the Black Reconstruction Congress, uh, so-called ex-captives, they were never slaves, uh, put through the first legislation for the public school system in America. 
And the second point is the first public school was uh, across the river on Bridge Street. And it was a colored school. It's called Colored School Number One. So I think it is significant in this so-called democracy that it was the uh, ex-captives who understood you cannot have democracy without public education. And with that in mind, I'm wondering if you're aware of the community control, control struggle in New York City, which as quiet as it is kept, was grew out of a progressive caucus within the UFT, you know, before Schenker took over, and they fought for community control of education with the idea that Paolo Freire was right, that you gotta have problem solving uh, education, and that the problems of the oppressed must be discussed and solved by the oppressed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I would ask people, you know, if they've read their Freire lately, <laughs> and I would, I would end with two comments. Number one, I think your risk was worth it. I hope Snowden feels that way. I hope Chelsea Manning still feels that way, mm -hmm. that what they did was worth it. I know for me it was worth it, and I wish I could do more for them. Mm -hmm. And I'm, nobody's more of a coward than I am. That's why I fight so hard because I don't want to end up in another type of concentration camp yeah. that's worse than the concentration camp I live in every day. And I appreciate Anna's statement about what it means to grow up being slapped in the face every day. But the last statement I would like to leave you with, I wonder if you believe with me, cats don't educate mice. They eat them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Wow. Can I share a Kentucky story in response to that? Sure. Uh, which which Freire uh, book? Which Freire book were you Pedagogy referring to? Pedagogy, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Oppress. Okay. Okay. Thanks. So I I just think you might be interested that in this discussion of what's the future for this part of the country after coal, there have been gatherings. There have been public gatherings at which everybody, from the guy who wants to make the federal prison to the guy who wants to have a new airport and another shopping mall is in the same room with the people who are talking about a more local sustainable economy, who are talking about uh, worker-owned co-ops and cooperative gardens and how can we create community media. And they are talking when they're asked about the assets that they have in their community. They can list them, and the list goes on and on and on of educated people and beautiful land and water that's still drinkable and people that care about each other and a history of shared concern because of the crisis the community faced during the worst of, of the industrial era, a history from the mountain people of Appalachia of looking after each other because how were you going to survive those hard times? The kind of history you're talking about that brought us the public schools, not from the rich but from the people who understood we need to do this together. And they said, what was the, if those are the assets, what's the biggest challenge? The biggest challenge was reality TV. The messages that we are given by our media of our own selves. They're thinking about Duck Nation and some of these things. They say still, after 150 years, we're still being told that we're hillbillies and stupid and ignorant. And that's the number one thing we have to change not just for those looking at us, but for us looking at ourselves. So I don't know quite exactly where that fits into your conversation, but I think that pedagogy of we're all suffering from the way that this is set up right now is the pedagogy we're missing. Because the pedagogy we're given is you can get yours, right? If you play along with the bureaucracy, if you, do as, if you get the great grade, if you don't take too many risks, right? So why should you look around and consider how fragile you might be or how, um, how much baggage you're carrying around? I will get there. Yeah, I'm going to hold it. Thank you. I'll keep it. Oh, I just, wanted, I just wanted to speak from my own experience. I think something was brought up, was very important about young people. Um, when I was 19 years old, I fell in love with a woman. I had previously been with men. This is 1969, and I was told I could lose my apartment, I could lose my job, blah, 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 a whole list of things. And I said, wait, I'm the same person I was 
Well, I was a man, this is unacceptable. I am one of the first people to join the Gay Liberation Front. I marched in the first Gay Pride March. We were told that the police would not protect us because the mafia had a contract out on all of us because we, our goal was to end mafia and police control and then to bring it out into the bigger world. And we were told we were all gonna be killed, blah, blah. It always takes a couple of people that say no, whether it's Bessie Hillman and the garment workers or Cesar Chavez and the, and, and the farm workers, but that's where it starts with just a group of people that have the courage and I'm not any more courageous than anyone else. It was just that it was unacceptable mm. to me. I and my mother said, they're gonna kill you. I said, I would rather die mm. marching for something that I believe in than to live my a life that's a lie. And there are so many people in this world that are willing to live that lie. But there's always gonna be people that will not live that lie. So that's my, my two cents. I want to bring it back to where we are uh, here at SLAM. Because one of the things that I'm hearing is that we need to practice, we need to exercise some new imagination muscles, some new courage muscles. And I think that's what you do here at SLAM. I think that's what your work does. It's one of the reasons I adore you. Um, the film coming out about Elizabeth that will be at the Film Forum in September, September 10th, mark your calendars, it's called Born to Fly. And in that film, your dancers talk. They do about the courage that you allow them to express. It's their courage. And I just wondered if any of the dancers wanted to talk to this question of, of courage and imagination and what you learn through your experience as a, as a flyer. Because we're all looking for ways to exercise some of these muscles, right? And also and like to dare to be that, that couple of people or that one person alone on a picket line. But also, can metaphor serve the function that, you know, feeding the masses and somehow figuring out how equity could play into our general population in the United States. But Do it, we believe that metaphor has the power to make a change? But it's no metaphor it's when you have a dancer part. dancing and flying in the middle of that moving machine. No, but it doesn't feed people and build shelter. Any other dancers want it's to talk about this? It. I bet they do. Yeah, I bet they on. do. Go say ahead. Just word. Force say my a bet word. they have something. No fair, really. But go on, say a word. Sarah the Callan, three of them gathered Cassandra over here. Joza, <laughs> courage. Sarah Donnelly. Did, 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 hey, Give four. them a hand, you guys. Any, Wait till any you see courage? Them. Only in a couple weeks. Only in a couple any weeks. Any courage lessons? <laughs> we, we want. We want to learn They'll some never courage come to lessons. We oh. want to learn some courage lessons. That's why we're here. We're not in the classroom. Wow, about courage. When they got it, I don't want to speak. Oh God. I think, I don't know, f uh, for me, I think that courage is, you know, it's, um, the word itself is, is something that you think of, but when you're actually confronted with, like, a, a, you know, a situation where you have to step up, it becomes like a moment by moment thing, you know, so it's not, you know, it's, you, you, you go home and you think, if I was confronted with the situation where I have to defend myself because of my race, because of my gender, because of my um, like sexual orientation, it becomes this huge thing, you know. And then when you're actually in the, in the face of it, or like when you're when you're punched in the face, you're you're at a loss for words in a way. So I think like courage and finding it here is something that happens moment by moment, and is something that's very intrinsic to who you are and that everybody has a moment where you are confronted with that, you know? So it becomes, it becomes something that's like breath, you know? And it becomes something that is practiced, you know? And it's not something that you just, you know, you just wake up with necessarily, you know? I mean, maybe some people are, maybe, you know, you just, you know, maybe that's what separates the mice from the men, but in terms of, my background and, you know, like I, I grew up as a gymnast, so, you know, you would see what I do in, in this building and you would think, whoa, like she's so brave, you know, but I think when I sit with what I do, it, it comes from the everyday, you know, where I have to sort of build myself up to, to be able to handle those situations, you know, as, you know, physically and then with a the mic 
in my hand and everybody looking at me, you know. So, <laughs> you know, I think that when I, when I first started Strab, I think the most, like, frightening moments were, you know, the Q&A sessions at the end of the show, you know, and I was like, put me on the wheel, please, and blindfold me. But I think after six and a half years, it, it becomes something that's, you know, I, you know, I, it's, 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 it wasn't as hard as I thought it was, and it's just about confronting those situations, like, over and over again, and just letting yourself grow, and finding, you know, just, just being safe with, you know, whatever happens, you know. So. Can I ask a question? Sure. Oh, because of that, you know, I think it's amazing what you guys do. Can you hear me? I don't know if my mic's on. I just think it's incredible what you do. And I am very risk averse. I'm afraid of heights and stuff like that. So when people can take physical risks, it blows my mind. And I wonder if there's something, and maybe this could apply to any type of risk taking that any of us do do, if there is a kind of, a, um, as humans, if is there something inside of us that that tells us what we can do, even if somebody says you can't, that we have an inherent knowledge of what we can do. Like I cannot do what you do. I'm thinking about my dog, uh, who's an Australian cattle dog. She's a mutt, and she knows all these things. She's never seen any cattle or sheep but she's a herder, she does all these things that are in her DNA. And when she was a little puppy, a friend of mine had said, whatever you do, don't let your dog get into your bed with you. And at the time I had a very high bed and it was a teeny tiny puppy, maybe, t maybe a month and a half old. And she wanted to get on the bed. And you know, <laughs> wasn't gonna let her on the bed. And she took a running start and got up on the bed. And it was like the most mind-blowing thing to me. I thought, how does she know to do that? So I think that some people have in them this sense of what they can do, and then they test it, and then they do it, and they become their own guide to it. The tragedy is, if the outside information is so distorted and so strong that you lose sense of that inherent sense of what your inherent talent or ability is, that nobody can really give you. And that's why I think art is such a great place, because some people do, you know, had a father who's a singer, or yeah, Natalie Cole, that type yeah. of thing. But in another way, it is something that some people are just like you, were born with it. It's yours. Yes, you went to school and got it to be better. And yes, nobody got in the way of you going to gymnastics class when you were a child, and then you get to meet Streb, and you don't have to join Alvin Ailey, you can do this, <laughs> uh, or whatever. Phew. But I think that there is, we have to respect the fact that there is something inherent in us that is something that we can do, that we're given to do, and it's just there. Yeah, I, I think, you know, it could be it could be also like audacity, you know, like the the idea that if you know if somebody tells you you can't, you will do it. You know, I think speaking personally, that growing up in this country as a woman of color, you know, who is gay, also you you're just like always confronted with an idea of what you can or can't do, and so you grow up, or you you know you just f like fashion yourself with either defeat or rebellion in some way. So I guess, you know, the people who are gathered in this room have maybe that inkling of, you know, like, I will not, you know, whatever that is, you know, depending on what their demographic is. And then maybe it becomes, you know, like that fact that, that, that seems like it's intrinsic, that you're born with, that you just, you know, I, I refuse to be, you know, what someone tells me to be, and I will be what I want to make myself, you know, become. And you practiced for six and a half years, I think is what I heard. <laughs> yeah. Did you want to say something? I did. I wanted to add to it. Uh, uh, yeah. Hello. <laughs> I also do not like Q the Q&As. <laughs> um, I think it's very similar to what you were saying earlier about imagination and how some people, you know, at some point they lose that ability or they, they decide to go a different direction. And we, we teach a lot of kids here, and we teach them from very little, and those kids the little tiny ones, like they won't do something if they know that they can't do it. 
So when I see them climb something extremely high, I watch them, but I don't get in their way and I don't stop them. And I think somewhere along the way, maybe as parents, you know, I'm, I'm not a parent, so I can't comment to it, but I do see it in the space. It's like, don't do that, you know, be careful, be safe, or whatever it is that you're trying to tell them. And then by the time they get to me, I teach the flying trapeze portion here. And by the time they get to me, they have all these things that they tell me that I feel like they heard somewhere else. I'm afraid of heights. I'm like, you're five, you know, like how, how high have you been <laughs> to know that you're afraid of heights? <laughs> so, you know, and I, and I tell them the same thing that you would say to people, which is, you know, you, you can't tell yourself that. If you say that you are afraid of heights, you will be afraid of heights. And they say, I can't do this. And I say, well, if you say you can't do it, then you're not gonna be able to do it. And I think that that all ties back in to, you know, them growing up in this culture. culture. But also, just to elaborate on, on what you were saying, the notion of everybody is born with something, and, and so what happens in that person's life that breaks that thing, that, that finally says, you're right, I give up. I'm not, because not every person is that strong or that able to push. So how do you begin to shift that? How do you begin to empower people to, to be who they are? Well, I gotta tell you that I met this teacher just now who, um, Teaches in, she teaches in the jails, uh, I mean the public schools that are inside of jails, but she's always ta taught in real rough places. And she was sitting in this school in the back of the room with this young man who had like this huge scar from a machete fight that he'd been in, right? She's already scared, she's a young teacher. She's already scared to death <laughs> talking to him. They were trying to learn animal farm or something. Right. And in the room walks this 350 pound 17-year-old Samoan girl pimp. And somebody in the school, one of the staff, had pissed her off. And she just, <laughs> it's not funny. She let the place out. Right. She let the place out. The boy ran out of the building. And in this school, right. they, don't, they restrain people as a right, last sure. measure. You know what the teachers did? They ran and hid in the closets. <laughs> but the, the assessment that my friend made about this girl was, you know, she said, it was, so, it was so fabulous. I can't remember how she said it, but it was so great. She said, you know, there are people, kids, who, who have this sense. They, they have a certain charisma. They can get people to do what they want. They could right. be CEOs. Right, absolutely, yes. That's, she's a pimp. She's right. not a CEO. Exactly. But exactly. you have to appreciate the fact that she has what a CEO has. Absolutely. And well, she's driven to be something. Well, how tall was she? Well, she was 350 know. pounds. I know, but that's tall. just latitude. I just wonder. <laughs> I mean, I'm saying. But it, I but we have to admire the it's fact, actually, even yes. though she's pimping girls out, okay. she can get people to do what she wants. I and would, that's yeah, why she goes bananas if they won't right. do what she wants. Yeah. It's not a very good social yeah, skill. I would. But I'm sure there's some CEOs just... who throw some tantrums. Oh, absolutely. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm sure the CEOs. I bet they like clear a room out, too, in some way. I don't know how they do it. We have one more question back here, and then we have to wrap. So I, I want you to think of closing comments. Oh, I'm actually afraid of using a microphone. Can I? Okay. Um, <clears throat> my, do I have to stand up? Are you going to hold it? Oh, wow. Um, my, my question is this, I, I am actually feeling like the greatest risk I could take, now granted I've never been a striped dancer, so that's, I haven't explored that, but is, is, is often the most mundane thing, um, like asking the person next to you on the subway to have lunch, you know, it's like, th these are the risks that kind of fascinate me, and I was just recently in a, um, I just, curious of your reaction. I was just recently in a seminar with a lot of journalists who had all done these incredible things, like, you know, uh, reported on the narco trade in Mexico and worked on the border and stuff like that. But the moderator did this brilliant thing of asking everybody in the room to pass their cell phone into the front, into this like huge bag. And the looks on people's faces was just like, I mean, I wish I had had a camera, right? Because nobody wanted to do it. Everybody immediately thought, not me, I'm gonna keep my cell phone over here in my bag. So it was just really interesting because these people who had taken such huge risks and then couldn't do the, the simplest little thing, which is take the risk of losing oneself or, you know, or, you know talking, talking to the person next to me. And I, and you know, I, I wonder you know, as a society, society if you think, if you think that, that maybe, maybe the greatest, the greatest lesson, lesson we can learn is just, is just to, to, you know, you know maybe, maybe jump, jump off, off a building, building but, but then also, also 
you know, you just, know talk just talk and, and have, dinner have dinner with a total, with a total stranger. stranger. Good closing, Good closing comment. comment. Good closing, Good closing question. question. Final, Final thoughts, thoughts, folks. It's so hard to conclude. There's so many different, because I was thinking very, very, I have noticed that people who seem to come from privilege, and I happen to do some research and know they do, <laughs> don't move their mouths. Oh, they do the minimum amount of, the sound comes out, but they're not moving their mouths. Their voices are so low that I'm thinking either I'm getting hard of hearing or they're just not talking loudly enough. And so you have to like be in a, you just have to get an inch away from them. And so I guess I'm wondering if other people notice that too. I, I think, <laughs> Streb, you know, I think your, Streb, I think your assessments of social class are usually quite profound. Um, <laughs> I would stick to the one that goes that, you know, uh, the richest people are the furthest away from any kind of danger and the poorest people have scars on their faces because they can't keep harm away from them. That's a quote from the interview that I did of you a few years ago. But this thing about the mouths moving. No, <laughs> no but I've been, I've, been doing, I've been doing some extra research and I have noticed this. So it's not as dramatic as the scarring metaphor, but. It's not, I wouldn't go with that one. Oh, I do. Yeah. Just, just wonder. Okay. AM, you have a final thought? Jeez, hard to follow that. Um, move your mouth. Though, I'm going to try and move my mouth. <laughs> I also, I, I speak in accents a lot, so I, oh. I'm, whatever. Anyway, um, I think in closing, for me, I, I think the couple things are, I think that, that uh, risk on all scales is necessary. And um, I would urge, you know, I, I just think, like, don't think about what you can do for yourself or to protect yourself. Think what you can do for somebody else or 10 other people. Get yourself out of the equation. We, you, my, we are not important. The bigger picture is the important thing. That's good. How do we like risky talk? Okay. It's OK? <laughs> Should we do it again? Laura, Laura Anna didn't say her. I, I, I was happy to speak about you. Oh, <laughs> It seemed like a great final. Is she a Jew? I was supposed to be a Jew. What? Is she? I might be. I, 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 said to, I know. I'm teasing. I'm just, okay. Well, it was a it was a joke about risk. And <laughs> there will be another mouth risky in another talking. episode. Never mind. <laughs> there Edit will that be part. another risky talking October twenty fourth. You can find out more information at the streb.org website or come to gridtv.org. We'll be putting edited versions of this conversation online. And I just want to thank you all for being willing to come out, be with other people, take a risk. There's food in the back. And I want to thank A.M. Holmes, Anna DeVere Smith, for joining so us here at Plan. Thank you so much. Streb, thank you for having us. You're welcome.